big round of applause for Mr. Dirk Alborn. Welcome back to the stage. Okay. Thank you. All right. You almost made it. So, so we are transforming transportation at the speed of sound. I would say literally. Um, we're building the Hyperloop. So who here knows what the Hyperloop really is? Okay, I'll, I'll test you guys later. <laughs> well, for everybody else, we have a video here that shows a little bit how it all started where we are right now and where we're going. So, enjoy. America's always been a nation of doers. We build things. We take risks. And we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Billionaire philanthropist Elon Musk has hinted at a new high-speed transport system that could put planes and trains out of business. I have a name for it name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan, move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel. It's something like that, yeah. Here's how he teased the idea in May at an All Things D conference. It's a cross between a Concorde and a railgun. It's called the Hyperloop. It's a system of giant suspended tubes. Riding within are capsules carrying people or freight traveling on cushions of air at speeds of up to 1,200 k's per hour, or roughly one kilometer every three seconds. A tube that would be on pillars from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and inside there would be capsule cars that would be rocketed forward up to 700 miles an hour, and that there would be a fan on the front. Elon Musk basically says that this is the way of the future. How would you like something that uh, can never crash? Mm -hmm. um, it is immune to weather. It goes uh, three or four times faster than the, the, the sort of bullet train, and it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket. It will only cost to build this six or seven billion dollars. Oh. Compare that to the 65 billion for the current high speed rail plans for California. He believes this is a viable, valuable alternative for mass transit between these two destinations. Could something like the Hyperloop actually be the answer to super fast, environmentally friendly, high speed travel between our busiest cities? So the gauntlet has been thrown down. A design document for a whole new super cool way to travel. The only thing now, will someone pick it up and make the Hyperloop a reality? There are some companies that are, that are forming to try to make the Hyperloop happen and uh, I, encourage them. I think that's that's great. Um, I'm super focused on Tesla and SpaceX and to, to you know small amount on Solar City. So that that basically completely uses up my my brain. Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The only resistance would be the air in front of the capsule which uh, we move to the back by using a compressor. Company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. Dirk Alborn says it's safer and more efficient than the railroad. Well the system is complete, completely computerized so um, you, know, you optimize the system and then you actually have the humans to monitor it. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system, we're completely managed by a computer system. There's no human factor that can actually create those issues. We actually plan on uh, seeing the first Hyperloop very, very soon starting. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane, actually. Obviously, for us, it's very important to make it as good of an experience as possible. So This is an independent organization that has formed. We have 170 engineers, scientists, and uh, really great professionals with amazing backgrounds. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods known as the Hyperloop is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. 
One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5, with construction set to begin in 2016. Let's bring in Dirk Alburn, who is the man who runs the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies team, which is announcing this deal with Quay Valley, California. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. That's um, when we will be start um, working on our development. So we will be starting ground uh, at the same time. Uh, we, at this moment, we expect to be done by 2018. Hyperloop now appears one step closer to reality. Starting next year, that theory will turn into a groundbreaking in Quay Valley. Kings County off of I-5. A developer there has just committed a big chunk of his private land toward the project. It's a five-mile loop that would take visitors through a planned entertainment district. There's going to be a test track. Elon Musk has announced that he's going to build a small-scale test track. It's a necessary step for us to be building a full-scale version, and um, Quay Valley is a sustainable model town of the 21th century, so it's a perfect fit. They're expecting over 10 million uh, visitors per year, so we will actually be able to re uh, generate revenues very, very fast. The company plans to go public later this year. We want to do a public offering. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. We want to make sure that um, the people that have been helping building um, the company and this technology are able to um, participate in, in, in the investment in the fundraising and the upside of the company. With their contributions to Hyperloop, these students from around the world now have stock options in the company, but they say they're not in it for the money. As a student, I start to feel like um, I'm in, a, in part of a, some great career that might change the world. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The so Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies. And it's the right time, it's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. Do so you think this is possible? This is not just... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. For all those who said this is just a neat little thing <laughs> to draw on a cocktail napkin, these guys are saying it will become reality. All right. <laughs> so those were basically, well, two years, put it together in four or five minutes. Um, so to iterate, what is the Hyperloop? Imagine a capsule filled with people levitating inside a tube and moving really, really fast from point A to point B. It's levitating on, um, in our case, a magnetic, it's a magnetic levitation system. So we actually developed um, together with one of the national research labs in America uh, a system that's a passive levitation system. So maglev, as you might have, who of you had the chance, experienced in, in China, is uh, active, which means it needs a lot of power, you have a lot of magnets, it's very expensive, it needs high power stations along the track. So this is, um, this is a system where, through the speed of the capsule, we create a magnetic field. We have basically a track, this track is a laminated track, it's a laminated aluminum track, and it creates a magnetic field that then, at a certain speed, makes the capsule levitate and not touch anymore. The biggest advantage here is that this is the safest possible way on how you can levitate. Even in the case of an emergency, if um, for whatever reason there would not be any electricity, the capsule would not just get down on the track. It would still levitate until it slows down to a safe speed and then touch down with the wheels that are, that are on the capsule. So safety is a very important part. We well, just announced actually yesterday um, a new construction method of, sorry, this is pausing you probably, um, a new construction method of the part where we created a new material. It's a composite material that has um, smart capabilities. So it actually senses material integrity. You just 
Maybe if you give me a handheld one. Awesome. All right. So basically, it's a double sandwich um, made out of, we called it vibranium. Well, vibranium is a shield of Captain America. It's basically the safest material um, we would have on Earth if it would exist. Um, my kids really like the name, so. <laughs> That's the reason for it. But um, yeah, for us, safety is one of the biggest aspects. So when you um, want to build a new mode of transportation like this, it can be done even much safer than we would do in an, in an uh, we would build an airplane. So basically, we have this panel. If anything would happen to the outer shell, we would um, see the material would tell us that there's a damage, even if it would be very small. And the inner shell would still keep you safe, would still keep you under pressure. And we could, once you're on the station, take the capsule out of circulation. So why do we need to do this? Basically, inside the tube, we create a low pressure environment. We take the air out. So it's a capsule, very similar to an airplane, that goes into high altitudes, can go much, much faster without any resistance. The whole system is on pylons. So this has the advantage that we don't have to buy a lot of land. Right of way is a big issue. It also has the advantage that we can integrate the latest earthquake techn technologies. We can still go from one end to the other. It's actually a very important point, because if you own the land and someone comes and wants to build a highway or wants to build a train, they just cut through it. And they don't care how you get from one side to the other. You just have to figure it out. They tell you figure it out or switch with, switch with your neighbors. Well, the problem is most of the times neighbors don't really get along. So it's actually a huge issue. Capacity is a question that comes quite often. With one tube, we are capable of um, substituting air travel between Los Angeles and San Francisco five times. And we have two. But we're also working on some concepts where we can just add tubes on, so we're over-engineering the pylons. So this is a very early concept that was done. We're, it looks much better now. But um, just to make you understand that there are, like for us, it's actually a good thing to run out of capacity because we are building not only a transportation method, but we're building a business. But I get there. The whole system is powered by alternative energy. It's completely green. We use solar, wind, kinetic energy, and in some climates, even geothermal. This is very important, not because we're all good people and we want to change the world and we should um, do something green. Yes, of course, it's great to do these things, but um, I personally believe that people drive a Tesla not because it's an electric car, but it's a really cool car, right? So you always have to find the advantages out of these things. Going green, but going green for a purpose. In our case, we're able to produce more energy than we're using. So we're basically lowering our operational costs. See, there's a problem in the world, and that is that there's no train, no metro that's profitable. We can be profitable within eight years on something like Los Angeles to San Francisco with a $30 ticket price in economy. Why should we do this? Why should we build a Hyperloop? This is why. Maybe not a problem you have here in Alsund. <laughs> but where I come from, this happens every single day. Traffic. We actually heard earlier, I think, how much time we spend in traffic, how much time is wasted, productivity, right? More than productivity, maybe we care more about how much time we're away from the people we love. Because you could be maybe an hour earlier home, still see your kids before they go to bed. But traffic is so important that 
based on where we live, we decide where we work. Based on where we live, we decide who we date. Because if she lives on the other side of the city, it's not going to work out. This is another reason. Traveling sucks. I don't know many people, I actually, sometimes someone raises their hand, that um, enjoy traveling. You enjoy getting to destination, but being in the airport, taking a plane, I mean, I do this almost daily, and it's terrible. You feel like animals put together somehow waiting that they open finally the gate. Um, your luggage might not be there. We can do better. This is another reason why. This is Beijing on a sunny day. On a bad day, you can't see the hand in front of your face. It's really that bad. Now, people say, well, this is China, of course. They can do better. But this is not only a problem that we have in China, in Mumbai. This is a problem that we have everywhere. Because everywhere in the world, we are losing time. Even in Europe, on average, you, you lose 14 months from your life because of pollution. So that's something to think about, and definitely something where we should act on. Now, traffic or cars are not the only thing, but it's a step. Well, this is what I said already earlier, the train industry is a dinosaur industry. They're old. They're not innovating. There's no innovation. The last real innovation in that industry was maybe maglev, which, by the way, was invented in the 1930s. Um, first prototype done in the 1970s in Germany. We're in 2016. I personally believe we can do much, much better now. So we can, we're wasting our time, we're wasting money by building high-speed train systems that are very expensive, that are never going to pay themselves, when we could look into finding new technologies and building things that are much cheaper. Let's take the rail for an example. This is the distance between the two. Anybody here knows why? What determines the distance between the rail? Sorry? Correct. The Roman carriage. This is how we build today trains. When we talk about innovation. Actually, France and Spain on the high speed, they have seen that and are going a little bit larger. But still, everywhere else in the world, it's a butt of two horses that decide how we build our trains. But if you would actually go a little bit larger, we could transport goods and people faster and, more importantly, safer. What I said earlier, making money. So everywhere in the world, we're losing money. The metro in LA is making 76 cents per passenger. And $2.50 are coming from the taxpayers. But that's not only something in LA. Even in New York, we have something like $2.2 billion in subsidies. And it's the same thing in Oslo, it's the same thing in Berlin. I think Germany has something like 5 billion euros of um, subsidies for transportation. But if you look at I don't want to make a name, some of the largest um, transport providers, how they actually handle digitalization, if you write their process of um, to know if a train is late on a wall, it's four meter long, and um, some of the steps are people calling each other. I mean, if I call an Uber, I know exactly where he is, where he's going, when he's going to be there. We can do better, much, much better. So how would it be, or how would our lives be if we would have something like the Hyperloop, if we would start innovating in transportation in this area, 
because everybody's talking about autonomous cars, and it's great. It's cool. I actually, I'm a big supporter, and I think that things are going to change much faster than most people think, because now every single young kid, smart kid in the world is working somehow in transportation. The guys that started, that cracked the first iPhone is working on a self-driving car. You have the smartest people now working on it, and that's exciting. But a Hyperloop has some advantages. So our airports are overflowing. We're building more and more. They're fairly close to the city because obviously we have to get there. So now we could actually connect those existing airports and make them become one. Airports would become terminals. Right? You could also bring them further out because it only takes minutes to get there. We were talking about freight earlier, ports actually a big, important part. You can bring ports further out in sea, bring the containers out in real time. Very valuable real estate. In Los Angeles, I think the port of Los Angeles, the real estate value is billions, I think $30 billion, because it's prime property. But we could live where we want. We could live in nicer areas outside the city, 100, 200 kilometers away, and still be within minutes in the city center. Just with the difference in real estate value, we can pay for the cost of building in Hyperloop. Right? Imagine you go out, you buy some land fairly cheap, you now announce that you're going to build a Hyperloop, the real estate value goes up immediately. We can work in one city and live in another. San Francisco, LA is a great example. Right? So it would completely change where and how we live and bring people closer together. But how are we actually doing this? And this is the part that I'm personally most passionate about because it's a really great story. And we're doing two things at once here. So the technology already exists. We know how to build pylons. We know how to build tubes. We know how to create a vacuum inside a tube. This is a CERN Hadron Collider. So the tubes are actually the same size than ours. And the vacuum is much, much higher. And the company that is maintaining that vacuum is actually part of our team. So when we talk to them about creating this low pressure environment, they basically laughed. I mean, it's, it's not as complicated and not as expensive as some people might actually think. The good thing about alternative energy is that it only gets better and cheaper. So already today, with the technologies that are available today, we are capable in California to cover the complete energy cost with solar. And we still have kinetic energy, and we still have wind. And in the next five years, this is only going to get better. But aside the technical elements, we're building a company in a completely new way. So I'm sure you've all seen the age are familiar with these companies. Sometimes I have to explain one or two of them. <laughs> they all have something in common. They all are failures. And yes, in Europe, sometimes someone still has a BlackBerry. But they actually deactivated Facebook, at least on the older models. So for me, they're definitely on the list. And then there's these companies. All of these companies have something in common as well. All of these companies at one point of the history were in trouble and switched over and integrated something called crowdsourcing. They started working with a the community. They, some of them have more than 50% of the innovation coming from the outside. Lego is a great example. Lego was going, doing very badly, almost bankrupt. They switched the CEO. The new CEO integrated crowdsourcing, and today the company is one of the most successful toy companies out there. If you want to present an idea to Lego, you can go to the website, other peers vote, and um, if you reach a certain amount of votes, Lego executives actually start looking at your idea. That's how they come up with their concepts, many of them. 
So, but when you build a train, when you build a metro, it's done behind closed doors. You hear they're planning something somewhere, you hear it's going to cost billions of dollars, but that's it. We do something that we call crowdstorming. And it's about working with the community, get their impact, questioning everything, every single thing. You can join the team. We, we, we want to hear your ideas. We want to hear your opinions. People are introducing us to, to governments. I have met presidents because someone sent me a Facebook message saying, hey, love what you do. I want to help. Why don't you come over here? So, but we're also looking at the status quo and do we have to do things this way? So before the question when we had the panel was about, well, but then people can just write and can just go in and um, basically steal a ride. That's correct if you believe, if you still believe in a ticket, for example, but we, that's a question that we have out here. Do we need a ticket? Is a ticket the best way to monetize? Because every business has to ask that con uh, continuously, what is my business model? All right. Is my business model selling tickets, or can I find something better? When I, earlier when I talked, actually, a light. There's one metro in the world that's making money. And it's done in a different way. So it's, it's broken up. It's Hong Kong. And Hong Kong makes money through real estate. All the stations, that's their model. They're losing, at the end, they're losing money through the metro, but the real estate, is booming. Every station is a hotel, a meeting complex. It's, it's amazing what they're doing. So it's always a question, you know, what is my business model? Is my business model the real estate development that I created and now the Hyperloop was paid for? Can I find other things, new things based on big data? We actually started a study together with MIT and um, my goal was to come up with one dollar per use. Can I generate one dollar per use of an app, a mobile app, you, knowing who you are, where you're going, when are you going where, when will you be where, and um, actually they came up with, I think, over six. And I think they lost, they, they missed actually a couple of areas, so we're still continuing working. But if we're looking at things, I mean, if I look at our construction cost, and I see whether we are spending billions of dollars for pylons, the question for me is natural in saying, can we do something with those pylons? So if I tell you, here are 200 pylons, they're yours, what are you going to do with them? And it's just asking the question that starts to make you think and starts people they, they're starting to think. And so some of the ideas are crazy, some are genius. Um, things like, let's make them into beehives, because that's actually a problem we're having. Let's um, make them turn into vertical gardens, or electric car charging stations. Or how about, there's a Slovakian scientist who said that he has a technology to, to store energy inside the pylons. So actually now using them for something. Or we found a technology in Germany done by the Fraunhofer Institute where we're able to create water out of air humidity with the same elements that we're already having for the Hyperloop. But if you don't think about those things, you'll never find them. So it's all about questioning and understanding, talking to people. I'm not going to think about how a, a mother of a newborn is going to you know, feed the child. Is it a good idea to have a family capsule and to, to make that happen because you actually anyways have a capsule every 40 seconds? All those things are coming comes from people that have the actual problem. They're saying, well, can I bring my bike? You know, I think, well, maybe bike ownership changes, but uh, at least you think about it, something that maybe before you wouldn't have done. So, 
in this is actually one thing we're doing, and we just announced yesterday as well, is we're creating a digital innovation challenge. And this challenge is not about the Hyperloop, really. It's about creating an ecosystem. Because if we want to build something that solves those issues, if we want to build something that people are using every single day, then we have to solve also the first and last mile issue. Because if it takes you an hour and a half to get to the station, you're not going to use the Hyperloop that much often. So all the modes of transportation have to be united. We have to work together. We have to create solutions. We are, it's not, and this is something maybe I give you, because I know many of you are companies, I, I want to give you to think about, is if you create an ecosystem or yourself, if you're the platform, which in this case we are, because we're the app where you can say you want to go here, and then we basically book the different modes of transportation, but there's a marketplace. And now Carl can come up with a new business idea based on the data that we provide him, and he can offer you guys the service that every time you, you book uh, uh, an intercontinental flight, your luggage is being delivered directly to your house. Or maybe it's a dating app that matches travelers. Anything can happen, anything's possible. I'm not even capable, I think, of imagining all the possible solutions that come out there. But what I, what I do know is that the way we are traveling right now and how this works is terrible. And an ecosystem can solve those things. So, if any of you uh, is interested in doing something in transportation, join us in Bratislava on the 6th of July and uh, we'll hope to see you there. And I hope to have a lot of Norwegian companies there as well. But we're doing more. We're working on different ideas. You're inside a capsule, you're inside a tube. That was the initial problem. We, you don't have a window. So what do you do? You create artificial windows. But now these artificial windows, if done right, can actually be a source of income. You can monetize on them. So this is more or less how it's going to look. we're using head tracking big data to realize where you're looking and based on where you're looking we're moving the image so that you really have the feeling that you're looking outside of a window the advantage here is I mean it's not only something for the hyperloop actually think about a metro you're in between stations there's nothing there everybody's looking at their phones but now if you could drive through Jurassic World terminate the land right for you, it's an experience. We're actually creating a new kind of content, experience content. And the transportation companies could make money because the advertisers would pay for it. So it's a win-win situation. So we have a team that's all over the world. We have over 520 people. Everybody is working in exchange for stock options. Everybody is united only by passion. And these are not just a couple of people in a chat room. These are some of the best people out there. Here are some of them. I'm responsible for business development at Live on Vacuum. I'm an educated economist. I've been working in solar energy for 15 years now. Program management, project management, and predominantly advisory for the Department of Defense. I come out of the music industry, kind of mostly known as a saxophone player with Pink Floyd. 
I currently teach at the University of Southern California. I wrote a book about augmented reality for marketing and PR. One year at CERN and three months at Spotify. And right now I'm working at Facebook. I work as a localization project manager. I'm an Emmy Award winning producer, editor, director. I'll be interning with Tesla Motors for the Thermal and Aero team next semester. I work as a product manager at Cisco Systems. All of my work is in the commercialization of innovation. I'm a product manager at the Walt Disney Company. I own a firm called Open Plan Consultants in Denver. I currently own and operate my own private legal and business development consulting firm. I am currently employed by Apple. I've got over 40 years in surface transportation. I'm currently a test engineer at SpaceX. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer for Aveta Global. We are the Hyperloops. We are the Hyperloops. <laughs> we are the Hyperloop. So basically when Elon Musk presented this project, he said he wanted someone to pick it up because he was too busy with Tesla and SpaceX. I was part of a nonprofit incubator that was funded by NASA at that time, and we were working on a new way of building companies by using the internet. Think about, you do everything online today. You buy your groceries. Um, you get your dry cleaning, you find your boyfriend, girlfriend online. You even can get divorced online in America. But when it comes to building a company, it's you with a buddy and a beer and a bar. Right? And you're thinking about an idea and you start working and maybe six months in you realize that nobody else has that problem. Or maybe that advertising isn't the best way of making money. That's actually the biggest problem that startups are having. Now, if you would have 500 or 1,000 people that have the same passion that you have, that give you their honest opinions, their ideas, their contacts, help you with tasks, you could build a better company. In some cases, these are your customers. In other cases, in like in ours, it's a completely new company structure. So when Elon presented this, we reached out and asked if we could put this on the platform. And um, we asked the community, should we start working on this? And not only did they say yes, you should be working on this, but they said, I want to be part of this. So we incorporated the company, got a small team together, and said, everybody who would like to join and work in exchange for stock options, please apply. We got more than 200 applications, got a team together of around 100 engineers, and started working on the feasibility study. The feasibility study was done at the end of 2014. Today, the company, as you saw, is more than 520 people, plus 40 companies. Some of these are Fortune 500 companies. And we have a community of over 30,000. It was very clear to us that we had to make this become a movement rather than just a company. I think every company should be a movement. So, I think I looked at it the other day, and we had something over 6,000 applications of people that wanted to join. And when they, we asked them, what do you bring? We even asked them, can you bring any money? We've never asked anybody to put the money in, but um, just interesting to see. It's, an interesting, it is, it's interesting data to have just to know how passionate people are, really are to make something happen. So here are some of the applications.
obviously many, many more. So why are we doing this this way? Why are we building a movement and not a company? Or why did we start it that way? Because now that, I've in, that I'm in it, I believe that everybody should do this. Imagine Rolls-Royce that was talking earlier saying, we're Rolls-Royce, but we don't really know how to do this. We want to create a new company, build a new boat, and people, this is our vision, and whoever thinks and shares this vision, join us. It might fail, but we want to try. And that's exactly the argument here. So something like the Hyperloop has been tried many times before. It's not a new idea. It, has not been, it wasn't Elon Musk idea. Actually, in New York, 1870, there was the first subway that was built, was a pneumatic subway. They built a station, they built um, the capsules, and it was a pressure difference that moved the subway forward. The goal was to connect LA, um, New York to San Francisco. Failed, maybe a little bit too early, but um, cheers to his ambition. The first patent of a, tu a, a train traveling inside a vacuum tube dates back to 1904 by Robert Goddard, one of the most well-known rocket scientists. 1969, popular science. The State Secretary of Transportation said that um, tube travel will change the way America lives. There are two projects they were working on and actually did prototypes. Then there were the Jetsons. <laughs> Even the Swiss tried. There was a project called Swiss Metro, which wanted to take a maglev train into tunnels underground, low pressure environment. The project was actually fairly successful technologically. They, you know, they still, I think they still had some issues cost-wise. Then there were the Simpsons. And then there was Elon Musk. So that's the reason why we started this and used the crowds. It had to be a movement. You had to not depend on one country. It had to be something all over the world. You're not stuck. If you depend on the US government, you'll never get these things going. If you're in Switzerland and the politician change, budget change, it's not, you're not going to move forward. There's a lot of interest, so it has to be something bigger. So, obviously, after we announced our, uh, uh, our feasibility study back in 2014, now there's many other companies. I think I saw an article today, the Russians are now building a Hyperloop. But that's actually great because it's part of the movement. Part of the movement also is that it, you're, it's not only depend on one company. Why I'm telling you this? Well, first of all, if you want to join, I want you to join the right one. <laughs> but I also think it's very interesting to see because I'm, I'm living it every day and obviously our model has a lot of criticism and, um, but I still think that we are the leading effort and some of them are very well funded and obviously show off and spend all the money. But you would be surprised that we had over 600 institutional and accredited investors that wanted to invest in this company. And we said, wait, we're not ready yet. We got land, easements for free, worth millions. We're moving forward. We're now ready to build. We filed our building permits. And all of this, basically, barely with any money. Why are we doing this? Well, in part, we want to show that you can do these big things without money. In part, we want to create more value for our team, for our shareholders, because really, money isn't really the issue here. But I just think it's super fascinating. So when are we going to see this? And I know I'm off, I'm, uh, I'm almost out of time, but um, actually, I'm over. <coughs> so as I said, we have land. We filed our building permits in Quay Valley, Kings County, California. Um, we did mapping and surveying, we're now in the environmental study. We expect to be able to finally break ground beginning, uh, sorry, end of this year. And summer looks like right now, it's more a political issue here. Quay Valley is a newly to be built town. We are right next to the freeway going up from LA to San Francisco. So next time you go up there, hopefully you see us building on the side of the road. But it's also going to be 
the, the most cutting edge developments existing. They're planning to be completely solar powered, at least in America, that's cutting edge. Um, using all, reusing all the resources. But the in interesting part for us, it's going to be an entertainment destination. There's actually three different resorts, a big theme park with a big brand, a big shopping component. So we're actually going to be moving 10 million people around. And we plan to open by 2019. We made an agreement with uh, the first sovereign nation, Slovakia, <coughs> which we announced um, roughly a month ago. So we're now looking into where to put in, uh, in Bratislava the first Hyperloop track with the vision to connect um, Bratislava to Vienna and Budapest. This is important because regulations is one of the biggest hurdles that a new system has. So having a government behind it that's interesting pushing it and creating innovation is amazing. Uh, this is my answer to, I think, the panel question that you had at the beginning. Right? So, you know, yes, there's always people that are criticizing, but then there's people that are pushing forward. And, um, well, you're all invited when we open, and um, I would love to hear your ideas if you have any, and if you think that you can bring something and want to be part of it, you're welcome to join us. Thank you. Okay. If you'd like to ask questions to Dirk, you're going to be hanging around for a while, so you're mm -hmm. available. I mean, uh, the guy's easy to spot. I'm sure you've got lots of questions to ask him. We're going to have to cut it short there. We've got a very good reason to do it. I'll explain afterwards. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the, the most powerful thing you said, that we've got to be doing this for a purpose. It's the for a purpose part which really struck me in that whole talk there. So I wish you the best of luck. You're on a mission. I can see that. I hope you're successful. I know you're going to be successful with your mission. <laughs> we Thanks are so much. already successful. A great Thank big you. round of applause.